evening, everyone. Welcome to this Movie Matters talk um, around the series News Hounds on Screen, Journalism at Stake. My focus tonight is on two documentaries. Uh, you will know that if you uh, took the opportunity to view them. Um, on the state of newspapers and journalism. So <clears throat> I'm going to be talking about um, a short documentary first, 22 minutes. That was the one you were able to see free on YouTube um, called Final Edition, The End of a Newspaper, 2009. And it focuses on the Rocky Mountain News, also known as the Rocky. That was a Denver, Colorado regional newspaper founded in 1859 and closed in 2009. The second documentary is a long form documentary, 90 minutes. That is page one inside the New York Times 2011. So this is focused, of course, on the newspaper known as the Gray Lady. Why the Gray Lady? For its longevity, long time existence, and its journalistic importance. New York Times has been an American daily, read globally, founded in 1851. All right, so that's tonight's agenda. So let me begin with the short documentary, Final Edition. Now this was a video project by uh, Matthew Roberts and some newspaper staffers uh, at the Rocky Mountain News in Denver. It documents the final two weeks of the Rocky. It's a tribute film, the last gasp before the doors close and the presses are stopped. The opening image in this documentary is of a cold, bleak, wintry Denver. There's a digital news scroll across the building that houses Denver's two daily newspapers, the Denver Post and the Rocky Mountain News. And the scroll reads, Rocky Mountain News for sale. The entire community can see what's going to be happening. There are intermittent shots throughout this 22 minute documentary of the bleak weather expressing the community mood. The film's closing image is one of darkness, a local newspaper lost to history. So the film traces the final days in the life of the Rocky. The staff are assembled to hear the announcement by the chair of the corporate owner that the Rocky is going up for sale. He says, we never would have done this in a different environment. He's not talking about the weather. He's talking about the economy. So we see the human cost, the strained faces and resigned faces of the staff. A few of them are quite jocular and witty. We're like a family, one of them says. The loss of jobs, one says, was brutal. The editor of The Rocky says, it's a terrible feeling that I may be the last person to hold this position. One of the reporters says, good storytelling makes people feel. On the Denver streets, people express loss and loyalty to The Rocky. As one of them says, it's the paper our paper. You won't miss it till it's gone. That ha handy tabloid style, I should say that handy tabloid size paper about the size of a magazine, easy to hold, easy to read. So the Rocky, a newspaper institu institution, covered not only local news, but national and international news as well. A reporter cup couple filmed in, at home with their school-aged children say this. The woman says the Rocky was known for getting to the bottom of hard questions. Her story in progress was scuttled, gone into the trash bin of local newspaper history. Her husband, also a reporter, I believe on the news on the uh, sports desk, 
says, when we came here, it was our forever newspaper. No sense that this would happen in 2009. The larger framework of the Rockies' demise, you know, is identified uh, in the context of Denver's population, almost 3 million. And here you see an image of the building that housed both the Denver Post and the Rocky Mountain News. And you see the media news group that owned uh, both of them um, and still owns uh, the Denver Post scripts. So here's this population of 3 million served by two newspapers under an amalgamation scenario from 2001 to 2009. Of the two newspapers, the Denver Pro Post was, and still is, the larger circulation newspaper. Both newspapers published six days a week, and of course they competed for stories. So here's how this amalgamation worked. It was a joint operation agreement that boasted 600 strong staff of journalists, 600 strong staff of journalists before the bankruptcy of the Rocky Mountain News in 2009. The Rockies advertising editor in the documentary cites that the internet was the biggest challenge. The penny a day subscriptions had ended and the circulation of the Rocky fell to 255,000 at closure. This was a newspaper that had banked up at least four Pulitzer Prizes and had a thriving past and was known for journalistic excellence. The next image you're seeing uh, on the screen is of the Den Denver Post and its headline Goodbye, Colorado, which was the front page obituary for the demise of the Rocky. No epiphany, no reprieve. After 149 years from 1859 to 2009, the final edition published February 27, 2009. And this photograph was taken by Associated Press photographer David Zelabowski at the closure. So in a study uh, titled Dead Newspapers and Citizens Civic Engagement by Lee Shaker, a Portland University um, journal entry, political communication. Shaker writes, newspapers are vital to institutions in our democracy and their decline warrants our concern. At issue, he goes on, newspapers fail to monetize their developing digital audiences as print circulation revenue eroded. During 2008, he writes, the Rocky lost about $16, $16 million. Alternating, competing, and collaborating with the Denver Post, that second daily newspaper, in their home market. Their large national corporate owners, Script, no longer saw a future in publishing the second newspaper in a two-paper market. Shaker concludes in his article, eliminating a local newspaper from a community leads to less civic engagement. If we desire healthy and productive democratic communities, he writes, then commitment to local news and information cannot be abandoned. All right, so let me put this in our local context here in the Niagara region. Think of this. We have three regional newspapers, the Welland Tribune, St. Catherine Standard, and the Niagara Falls Review. These three newspapers all operate under one editor-in-chief. The structural amalgamation worked like this. The Torstar Corporation, which owned these three newspapers along with other uh, newspapers and media, sold to Northstar 
capital investment in 2020. North Star not only owns these three newspapers, but the Toronto Star, six regional uh, dailies, including the Tribune, the Standard, and the Review, 20 community papers, plus news and digital sites. Note, online editions. Post the reading time for each article, typically two minutes. So if I look up an article uh, of the Niagara Falls Review, for example, or the St. Catharines uh, Standard, it might typically say two minutes reading time. Now, doesn't this say something about distracted readership today and the competitive newspapers that have to signal as to how short the reading time will be for this article? It puts a lot of pressures on the reporters writing these um, articles. Note, print readership and newspaper sources other than, than print are also issues for the esteemed New York Times. And so I'm going to turn now to the documentary, page one, inside the New York Times, 90 minutes, 2011. And 2012 report on the New York Times reads like this. It's the most respected newspaper in the world. Noam Chomsky, co-author of the book Manufacturing Consent, said that the New York Times was the first thing he looked at in the morning, and I'm quoting him, despite all its flaws and their real, it still has the broadest, the most comprehensive, uh, comprehensive coverage of any newspaper in the world, end of quote. All right, let's look at page one. The documentary filmmaker is Andrew Gossi. Now he also made in 2016, a film, a documentary called First Monday in May. It, it's a behind the scenes look at the preparation for the MoMA, the museum of, <clears throat> uh, in um, New York. Uh, it's annual event of a glam fashion, fashion event known as the Met Gala and the exhibition that goes along with the uh, Met Gala. And another documentary in 2014 called Ivory Tower. It's an investigative documentary on the cost and value of higher education in the U.S. So Ro Rossi's point of view docu documentaries then, these two plus page one, they focus on established American institutions. Page one approach is indicated in the subtitle, Inside the New York Times, Insights into the State of Newspaper Journalism Today. Rossi's co-writer Kate, was Kate Novak, uh, a Time Magazine arts and media reporter. So the film opens on a fleet of New York Times trucks and huge reams of newsprint, the material of print media. And we see a report on the Rocky as a crisis in print publication of the dailies. And here's an exterior shot of the New York Times building. Rossi films inside the New York Times for a year. He probably dumped a lot of footage, uh, but in the process of filming over a year, he was looking to find what and who he was going to focus on. Exploratory. So the documentary core focuses on around the news desk, the human faces and character of three working reporters. The veteran, David Carr, the rising star, Brian Steltzer, and Tim Marengo, who is mentored by Carr, and also Bruce Hedlum, the New York Times media desk editor. Now, David Carr is introduced early. What's the story to tell, he says. Not a headline, but the meat of investigative journalism. Media editor Hedlum um, refers to the New York Times as an exemplar of newspaper tradition, still an old school business. And here you see an image 
from 1942, the New York Times newsroom. And look at these journalists. There are tools, a telephone, and the typewriter. And the adjacent image you see is the New York Times. It's a still of the New York Times newsroom in 2011 when Rossi was making his film. It's a shot of the film. And on that escalator midway stands the um, editor and a woman named Judith Abramson. She's being introduced to the assembled staff or some of the assembled staff as the first woman appointed executive editor of the New York Times, 2011 to 2014. Now, I want to bring you up to date on the diversity of staff, all staff, in 29. This is a 2019, pardon me. This is, a, this is a New York Times company report, and I'm quoting. Women now represent 51% of staff, 49% of leadership. People of color represent 32% of staff and 21% of leadership. And the report, uh, report goes on to note that the more people of color in all uh, ranges and el all elements of the New York Times, the more diverse the newspaper becomes. So we get a, a media report, a prof who comments as an external voice among the uh, voices that we see and hear in the newspaper that the New York Times is one of many voices in the marketplace of journalism. Brian Stelter has a story in progress with WikiLeaks as a possible story. He talks with present day Julian Assange. There's also a, an historical reference footage in the film cited of the leaked Pentagon Papers in the 1990s and President, then President Nixon's anger at the New York Times for publishing the leaked papers. Note, the point here that I want to emphasize is that certain stories evolve over time. Some are historically based, some change, and some of those have set precedence for how journalism, investigative journalism, continues. The film eavesdrops on the news deck, desk that is competing to get on the A1, the front section, front page of the newspaper. Time and pressure, major tension, pull, push-pull processes, decisions, how are they determined? What is the scope and the scoop of cover stories? What are the points of views over other competing stories and other dailies? Veteran reporter David Carr has a very colorful background. There's a clip from um, Stephen Colbert's old former um, television show called The Colbert Report, where he posed as an imposter, a right-wing imposter. Uh, it was a very um, satirical, interesting uh, program, some of you will remember. And in that clip, he challenges Carr how did a former drug addict like you get to be a respected journalist? Indeed, how did he? And here is an image of David Carr two years after page one was released in 2013. In the film, David Carr is cool. He has street cred. He is a charismatic star, more than a survival. He understands the New York Times exceptionalism and the tenets of investigative journalism. And every masthead on the New York Times has a slogan that goes back to its roots, 1897, all the news that's fit to print. Note, Carr says he does not think much of Twitter guys always checking their cell phones. Carr addresses in the film his terrible drug addiction period. He actually wrote a book about it. To become a journalist, a steady family man, 
the reflective person with a raspy voice that we see. That was another life, he says, another guy. I've been a single parent on welfare. On welfare. This crisis today is nothing. What is that crisis? By 2019, 100 newsroom jobs were gone, laid off at the New York Times, the same year that Denver's Rocky Mountain News closed. In the film, the New York Times literary theater editor is on retiring, notes the pressures, and she references the funereal mood that took over the place. There's an amusing scene with Carr meeting with Vice Media Group. He dresses down their dresses them down for their low bar in what they do, in what they post online. They're not really journalists, in his view. Carr is the savvy standard bearer of how and why of investigative journalism. <clears throat> the vice scene is juxtaposed with Carr welcoming young Tim Arango to the New York Times. Rango ultimately is assigned to Iraq to become head of the New York Times' Iraq Bureau. This is the evidence of the far reach of the New York Times and the way it builds legacy. Carr ponders the question of sensational reporting versus good reporting. It's an old question, he says, but salient. Now, evidence of bad reporting and an unethical reporting is the failure of two fired New York Times reporters, one a woman, the other a man. Fabricated stories, plagiarism, skewed sources. Their failures became headline stories reported in the New York Times and other newspapers. In the documentary, author Gay Talese is shown to be part of a panel discussion, and he refers to the New York Times effect, that is, the New York Times wide public reach as a journalistic model. Another talking head in the film is Carl Bernstein, who comments on the Watergate investigation. He was involved with his partner in two years of coverage writing over a hundred stories at the Washington Post in a single year on the Watergate. Carr's tool is the tele telephone in interviewing and developing a story as the film, as the documentary is being filmed, exposing the Tribune company. He talks about the corrupted workplace under the crude owner, billionaire, Sam Zell. You notice how bil billionaires want to know, uh, own many things, and they seem to love owning newspapers. So here is the headline story that's in progress that was ultimately published by Carr in the New York Times, October 5th, 2010. It's titled, At Flagging Tribune, Tales of a Bankrupt Culture. I'm just going to read you an excerpt from his story to give you a sense of it. Quote, Zell's top executive, former radio shock jock, and his executive's use of sexual innu innuendo poisoned the workplace banter with profane invective that shocked and offended people throughout the Tribune and the Tribune Tower. The Tribune Tower, he says, was the architectural symbol of the staid company in Chicago that came to resemble a frat house, complete with poker parties, jukeboxes, and pervasive sex talk. That's a, a, a tasty excerpt from Carr's story. Now there's human loss here after the filming and release of Ro uh, Rossi's documentary film on the New York Times. David Carr died in 2015, age 58. Of course, he's one of the star figures in the documentary. And we often see star figures in documentaries. 
who act as the go-betweens or the catalyst for the documentary filmmaker. The documentary, documentary filmmakers find and follow them behind the camera. In 2011, David Calhoun in um, Time Out wrote this about the documentary front page, or page one. Rossi keeps coming back to Carr, a gravel-voiced guy in his 50s for whom he has affection and could easily be mistaken for a bus driver on his scruffier days. You can see why Rossi likes him. He has the enthusiasm and bite of a youngster, but with all the confidence and disregard for niceties of an old pro. Carr ponders the iPad, writes Calhoun. You know what it reminds me of, says Carr, a newspaper. Brian Seltzer, who went on to become an anchor at CNN, writes a tribute, a homage to David Carr, calling him a lasting totem. And this is what he writes. David Carr's digital history is always just a few keystrokes away. As strange as it is to see his Facebook Page, still online. One of his last posts was about how Brian Williams should not be drummed out of NBC, foreshadowing the week's news. I appreciate these posts being there. And now that Carr is gone, I find myself rereading and finding new meaning from them. The emails are a 21st century record of a moder modern father-son mentor mentee relationship. NPR's Rob Bob Mondello in 2011 wrote a review of the pay, of page one documentary. Quote, page one is an insider's view, but it isn't breaking up any muck. It's not a love letter either. It's more a portrait of an institution at a mo moment of transition when page one space still qualifies as precious real estate. And the question of whether it'll hang on to that value is, at least for old school journalists, disconcertingly up in the air. A related issue then in page one in the documentary is, is news free? Has it ever been free, either on print or online? We're always paying and should pay one way or another. The point here, though, is that subscribers are essential, as is advertising revenue. Bill Keller, the New York Times executive editor, discusses the loss of revenue. And he raises the perilous question, could the New York Times go bankrupt? This despite over, well over 100 Pulitzer Prizes over the lifetime of the New York Times. In a book titled Why Journalism Still Matters, published in 2018, Michael Knudsen writes, the following newspapers already have more than 100,000 paid digital subscribers, the New York Times, the New York Post, the New York Daily News, Newsday, the Newark Star-Ledger, the Los Angeles Times, and the Denver Post. They may still sell print editions at premium prices for several decades to serve people, like me, I have to say, addicted to newsprint with their morning coffee or on their morning commute. He goes on to say, most people get their news from television, 69%, 50% from digital sources and 28% from newspapers. Television is easy and convenient, and that is not a bad thing. But here's the punchline. Most people do not understand, nor do not care, that television gets its news from newspapers. He says, if what really matters for the social and civic welfare is not the disappearance of a newspaper product tossed on the doorstep, that the thinning of fair-minded, analytical, and watchdog news reporting, how much of a decline, if any, are we witnessing? So here's what, how I want to sum up. 
Many of you will remember this book. I'm sure many of you purchased it. Images of a Century, the City of Niagara Falls, Canada, 1904 to 2004. Largely, the research for producing that book came out of over 100 years of archival Niagara Falls Review newspapers. Sherman Zavage, Zavitz and Andrew Porteous and staff researchers culled and mined those archival review newspapers that, as I said, makes up large, much of the content of Images of the Century. Now I can tell you about, I'll get personal here, about my archival research and my readership. For crucial writing projects, two of which will, should be published this year, the Niagara Falls Review archival newspapers, crucial. I spent hours, days, weeks, years reading archival editions of the Niagara Falls Review. Linking past to present. I'm a subscriber and reader of the St. Catherine Standard in digital format every day. I'm a subscriber reader of the New York Times digital format every day. I'm a subscriber reader of the national newspaper in print format of the Globe and Mail. For me, newspapers are a lifeline to community, to country, and to the world. And I want to end on this note. There's nothing or few things that please me more than hearing the toss of that print newspaper landing like a thud on my front porch at 4 a.m. in the music. I wait, it's music to my ear, go back to sleep. You get up a few hours later, you make your coffee, retrieve that newspaper. That's my story. So in two weeks, we will conclude this series on uh, news hounds um, on screen and uh, journalism at stake uh, with uh, the film The Post. So in two weeks, my last Movie Matters talk for this series will be right here. Look forward to seeing you.